Good morning, everyone. I'm Meredith Dancos. I'm the lead pastor here. If you're joining us for the first time, welcome. We're so glad you're here. If you're joining us online or on the app, we're glad that you're, tuning, you're tuning in. Uh, we are in our final week of Origins, where we've been looking at the first 11 chapters of Genesis and how that is the origin story of Israel. And we're coming to the last chapter of that. But to start, I wanted to tell you an origin story of my marriage. So Steve and I got married in February, and we lived in New Hampshire. So, you know, it's cold in, in, uh, in February in New Hampshire. It's a lot of snow there. And uh, we had our, like, a rite of passage after we got home from our honeymoon. We had to set things up. And you know that a, a rite of passage in a marriage is assembling something together, you know, some piece of furniture. And so for us... One of the very first things we assembled was a shoe rack, which looks kind of like this, because in New Hampshire, in the winter, you have to have a place to put your shoes, otherwise it will ruin your carpet because they're full of snow and mud. And so we, as you may have this in your family as well, we have two different approaches to assembling things. So my approach, which I want to say is the right approach, is where you take all the pieces out, you line them up, you make sure you have them all, you look at the instructions, you kind of get a lay of the land and figure out what you're going to do. Steve's is, how hard can it be? It's a shoe rack. Let's just jump in and do it. So I, I decided to go along with his way and try to do it. I can tell you now we don't do it that way anymore because you think, oh, that shoe rack, how hard could that be? Well, ours ended up like one part was like the top was on the bottom. It was kind of angled. It was all angled all different ways. And we had to take the whole thing apart and then read the instructions and put it together. And it's a good lesson both in furniture building and in life that if you start assembling without instructions if you miss the instructions well you might assemble in your own wisdom and you might assemble it wrong it might not go so well for you and today we're looking at the tower of babel which is the ultimate human building project and we're going to see that humanity missed the assignment they didn't quite get it and they started without the instructions and it did not go as they planned so again we are ending that first 11 chapters of Genesis, and that is known as the prehistory of Israel, the prehistory of Israel, setting that up. And we've seen in this prehistory, this context that, that helps us understand the rescue plan that starts with Abraham and finds its fulfillment in Jesus. We've seen creation. We've seen the fall. We've seen that sin has been let loose in the world through Cain's decision to murder his brother Abel. We saw decreation in the flood with the, with the recreation uh, afterwards. And then we get to the, right before the Tower of Babel, we have the, the table of nations. And we see that humanity has been doing part of the creation command. So the creation command is be fruitful and fill the world. Well, they've been fruitful, they've multiplied, but they're having a hard time with the second part of that commandment. So we read in Genesis 11, now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. They said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. And so humanity at this point has one language, and there's no barriers of communication. There's no barriers for them to make a plan together. And we're told they're moving eastward. And that's a significant direction because that's east of Eden. That's moving away from Eden. It's the direction of separation. But also the word there gives this sense that they're meandering. They're kind of wandering. They're not quite sure where they're going. And they arrive to this plane and they come up with a plan. Let's build ourselves a city and a tower and let's hunker down. The problem with that plan is they're missing the instructions that God has given them three different times. So in Genesis 1, 28, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. In Genesis 9, 1, God blessed Noah and his sons saying to them, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. And Genesis 9, 7, as for you, be fruitful and increase in number, multiply on the earth and increase upon it. And so they're told by God to fill the earth and instead they want to settle down in one spot. And the reasons they want to settle down are the same reasons why we tend to settle down and not follow what it is that God's asking us to do. So let's look at their plan a little bit closer. Their plan says, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. And their whole motivation 
for settling down is because they are afraid to be scattered. They don't want to be scattered across the whole earth, and so they're feeling insecure. And so the foundation for this tower is fear. They settle out of fear. And the interesting thing about their fear is that word scattered, right? if you hear scattered, it, it uh, gives this connotation of like chaos and wandering and pointlessness and you know vulnerability. But that same word can also be considered to spread out. And that is the same way that it's used right before Genesis 11. In Genesis 10, 32, these are the clans of Noah's sons according to the lines of descent within their nations. From these, the nations spread out over the earth after the flood. Same word. And so your perspective makes a big difference as to how you see what it is that God's asking you to do. For them, they feel, they feel like God is going to scatter them, and they feel exposed, and they feel vulnerable, and they are looking for a source of security. They're looking for a source of security. It could have been spread out, but instead they let their fear drive their decisions. And it's the same thing for us. When fear starts to drive our decisions, when we trust our fear more than we trust God and God's goodness, and we start to see the world through what ifs and our worst fears, everything that we could imagine. And when we do that, when we feel vulnerable and exposed and insecure, we also look for ways to make ourselves feel, feel secure, where we're going to hunker down and not necessarily do what God asks us to do. And that shows up in two different ways. Sometimes it's resistance. That's when we drag our feet, right? We hem and we ha, and we get into analysis paralysis, and we start to think, like, I make checklists, and I'll wonder, and I'll ask this person, and I'll ask that person, and we, we practice the art of delay. Like, I haven't said no to God. I just haven't gotten around to saying yes yet because I don't feel ready to do that. So we end up staying stuck just because we're resistant. But sometimes we also settle down because we refuse. We refuse. And that is when we dig our heels in and we just say no. And sometimes that's outright disobedience. Sometimes it's stubbornness. But in the end, it's, I, I don't want to listen. I don't want to hear. I don't want to change God because I want security. And the thing about trust is trust is risky. Trust is risky business because you don't know where it's going to lead. You don't know what God's going to do with that. And so we put our trust in our own sense of security which then leads them to the second part of their plan, which is let's build a city with a giant tower that reaches to the heavens. Why? So we can make a name for ourselves. And when they do this, they move out of seeking security and into seeking significance. That now I want to make sure that people know me for something. And so they move from settling out of fear to settling in to pride. And pride is always when we try to take God's place. That's exactly what happens in the garden, right? We've got the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and Adam and Eve see it, and they think, well, I don't need to rely on God for my knowledge if I take it for myself. I can be in control of that. I can determine it myself. And that's exactly what's happening in Babel. We don't need to rely on God who wants to scatter us, and if he scatters us, we're going to be insignificant, Who's going to know about us? What, are, what will we be known for? But if we band together, we can make a name for ourselves. We can determine our own future. We don't need to rely on God. That's always what the role that pride plays in our lives. And so when we get that way, when we start to feel, feel like, well, what if I'm insignificant? I want to not just be known, but I want to be known for something. We can try to make our own name, and they're not always bad names, right? Sometimes the names are successful or talented or smart or powerful. Sometimes it's beautiful. Sometimes it's nice. I, I'm, I just want, I want everybody to think that I'm nice. I never have anything bad to say. I never complain. I'm just a nice person. Sometimes it's funny. It's reliable. It's helpful, popular, important. I know for myself, it's often competent, right? I want people to see that I am competent and I, I can do things. And, I, and you know, if you ask me to do it, I'm going to master it. And we start to build a tower around our personality. And we start to see people as mirrors rather than relationships. Are you reflecting back to me the image that I'm projecting out in the world? Am I in control of the name that I have given myself, the name that I think will earn me approval, success, significance. And it's so much easier 
to depend on ourselves to give ourselves significance. I, none of those names are bad, but identity was never meant to be something that we gave ourselves apart from God, in competition to God. Identity was always meant to be something we receive from God in partnership with God, but it's so much easier to trust in our own sense of significance than risk, what if God asked me to do something that makes me insignificant? And then when we start playing God in our own lives, the truth is we're not all that good at it. We're not as good at playing God as God is. And so we end up, we settle out of fear, we settle into our pride, and then we end up ultimately settling for less. We settle for less. This story goes out of its way to make sure that we know that the, that the Tower of Babel was built out of bricks. It's built out of bricks. And here's the reason why. Bricks are a human invention. Bricks do not, they're not naturally occurring. They take God's creation and human ingenuity and make bricks. And bricks are wonderful because they're consistent, right? they're predictable, and they're controllable. Humans are in control. So the emphasis that's being brought forth in the, this story is that humans are building this tower in their own strength, their own wisdom. It is not a monument to God. It's a monument to themselves. It's a monument to themselves. And they're using the very best that they can bring, but the truth is brick isn't as good as stone. And they can't make stone. The temple of God, when it's built, it's built out of stone, but they can control brick. So they're trying to build on their own terms. And when we try to build on our own terms, we also are trying to use things that we can control. When we build our relationships on our terms, our career on our terms, our reputation on our terms, even our faith on our terms, it's all things that I can control. It's predictable and it's consistent and I don't need to rely on anyone else. And sometimes that control looks like avoidance. It looks like avoiding certain types of people certain types of challenges. It sometimes looks like avoiding certain types of activity or work because someone might judge me for that. Someone might think less of me if I enjoy those types of things. It sometimes it's avoiding certain sacrifices, certain things that we know we should give up or that we should build into our lives because it might make us uncomfortable and make me feel out of control. And other times, it looks like compromise. And that compromise is that we begin to lower our standards. Because, again, we feel more comfortable. We feel more in control. I can lower my standards. Maybe I lower my standards around what I do for work. You know, I get a good paycheck, and, you know, I can drive a great car and go on a vacation, and I like my house. It's, it, like, sucks my soul out each week, and it's where I spend the most of my time. But you know what? I don't want to risk doing something else. I want to risk putting myself out there and going to something worse or finding something different. Sometimes we compromise in our friendships and we compromise and we settle for shallow friendships. You know, friendships where it doesn't ask much of me, I never have to show up and when I'm not perfect or I don't have it all together, or maybe I'll mess up and, and I don't have to ever see anyone else's mess ups, like their stickiness is never gonna impact my life and that's fine and I can settle for that. Sometimes we settle for mediocre marriages or we settle for mediocre parenting relationships. Sometimes we settle for, you know, poor physical health. We think, well, I don't want to do that, that work to, to be at my optimal health, and so this is fine. I'm just going to settle for this. And when we end up settling, when we settle out of fear, and we settle into our pride, and we settle for less, the truth is we just build towers to our insecurities. That's all it is. It's a tower to everything that I'm afraid of, that I'm worried about. It's a tower of my own insecurity, and it's never as good as what God would have for us. And I've seen this in people. You know, people just settle in their lives and they get stuck. They settle for the uncritical pursuit of wealth. You know, they settle for relationships that look good on the outside but have no substance on the inside. But I've seen this in groups. I've seen this in Bible studies even where a group will settle into, you know, we don't challenge each other anymore. We all already know what we believe. And so it doesn't ask anything of me. It's fine. We settle. I see this in churches where whole congregations or whole parts of congregations just settle and say, don't, don't change things. Don't mess with things. Don't, don't make me think about my theology. Don't ask a, a hard question. Don't make me get out of my comfort zone. I'm, I'm settled right where I am. And we build all of these towers. But the truth is when we look at our towers, they feel impressive to us. But in, when it comes to God's perspective, they're nowhere near what God can build. Let's continue with the story because we see that humanity doesn't do a great job 
of playing God. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower and the, the, the people were building. And the Lord said, if, if as one people speaking the same language, they've begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So first of all, you know, from the, from the human, humanity's perspective, they're building this tower up to the heavens. But notice God. He's not up there being like, whoa, where did this tower come from? Like, what are these people doing up here? He has to come down to see what's happening, right? It is not measuring up to where God is. So God has to come down. But notice what God does not do when he comes down and sees this tower. God does not mock their tower. Be like, oh, you think this is a tower? You think you're anywhere near the heavens? Right? God does not destroy the tower in a fit of rage. How dare you try to take my place? Who do you think you are? God doesn't ban the making of bricks. He's not like, well, that's it. You used your talent and the brain that I gave you to do something that's against me, so now no more creating. No, but God does take it very seriously. He takes it very seriously. He sees that this is a problem. He says, look, look what they can plan together. What would even stop them? And the only other time that we see language around this type of plan coming to its fruition, that nothing be able to stop it, is in Job, where Job is talking to God, and he says, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. And here's the problem right now, is that humanity has come up with a great plan for themselves. It seems like an awesome plan. We don't want to be scattered. That makes us feel insecure. It makes us feel like we'll be insignificant, that we're out of control. Let's just build right here. Let's all just settle down. But it is actually working against God's bigger plan. And so God takes action. So the Lord scattered them from there all over the earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why it's called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. And so God confuses their language, and he scatters them, which just feels like the absolute worst thing, right? It's what they were totally afraid of. It's what kicked off the whole project. He's going to scatter us. And then we're not going to be secure and we're not going to be safe. But I need us to hear the scattering is not a punishment. The scattering is not a punishment. The scattering has always been the plan to spread out and fill the earth. It is what God has always wanted to do. It is setting up the context of the rescue plan in Genesis when we see Abraham come on the scene, Genesis 1 through 11 shows us why we need a rescue plan. That humanity was created to be in a trusting, connected relationship with God, and that got broken because they didn't trust God. And God has decided never to destroy humanity again, but to save them. And so the scattering, the spreading out is the plan in order to make that rescue happen. And we see that the beginning of that, in the calling of Abraham, the very next chapter. The Lord said to Abram, go from your country, your people and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. Do you hear the go? Keep going. Don't settle down. Go to where I will show you. I will make you a nation. I will give you a name. That's the beginning of this promise that God has kicked off his rescue plan, which is all about redemption through trust, which is what faith is. Faith is synonymous with the word trust. Trust was broken in the garden, and God's rescue plan is to bring humanity back into a trusting relationship with him, where they will rely on him and depend on him and trust his goodness. And so we see from Abraham, go and I will make a name for you. And that name becomes the nation of Israel. And out of the nation of Israel, we see Jesus, the Messiah, who is the fulfillment of this plan. And when Jesus comes on the scene, he changes the story because Babel is all about humanity trying to get up to the heavens and claiming the blessings and the promises from there. But, but Jesus is about heaven coming down to us, meeting us right where we are but not telling us to settle in. He continues, like, come on, let's keep going. The, the instructions, the plan didn't change. So Jesus, he shows up and he's preaching this kingdom and people are like, all right, where are we setting up the kingdom? What does that look like? And in Luke, we have this interaction 
Once on being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, the coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed. Nor will people say, here it is, or there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst. And when Jesus says that, he's pointing to himself. The kingdom of God isn't a place where we're going to set up shop and build a tower that gives us security and significance and control. The kingdom of God is brought about by a person. It is the presence of Jesus. And after the resurrection, when his disciples have seen the resurrected Jesus and they've been traveling with him for all these years, and they turn to him and say, okay, we did the crucifixion resurrection thing. When are we setting up the kingdom now? Like, what, when, are, when are we starting to build the tower? And Jesus says, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. They were expecting him to say, okay, now we're ready to settle down. And he said, instead he says, keep going. Keep going. The command is the same. The instructions haven't changed. Spread out. Spread out. Fill the world. But this time it is fill the world with the good news. And when we do that, Craig Barnes, who is my church history professor, he wrote a book called Finding Home. And it's a wonderful book. And he makes this distinction. He says, as we're, follow as we're followers of Jesus, he changes us from nomads to pilgrims. Because nomads are scattered people who are looking for security and significance. They keep going to the next spot and the next spot, hoping to find it there. He says, but pilgrims, pilgrims travel purposefully towards a destination that they already know where they're headed. But the whole point of a pilgrimage is the journey towards home. And so he says, when we see ourselves as pilgrims and not as nomads, we can't settle down. We can't settle out of fear. We can't settle into pride. We can't settle for less because we're called to something more. He says, so while we inevitably journey through contemporary society, we have the opportunity to be so much more than a people who settle for a place, and even so much more than meandering nomads who seek only the next place. We can be pilgrims who nurture the memory of the Father's house where we truly belong. Those who have this vision of life discover the blessing of their life's meaning and purpose, which is simply to take the next step toward home. And so as followers of Jesus, we don't settle into a place. We don't settle into a name, a role. We don't settle into a set of circumstances. We settle into a person. Augustine says it like this, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they can find rest in you. The place where we find rest, where we find stability, where we find significance, where we find security is in the person of Jesus. And he came embodying the home that we're meant for. And he pointed us toward it. And he told us to follow him. And as we journey with him towards this home, we bring blessing along the way. Again, Craig Barnes says, if our real home is with the triune family, a father son, and spirit, then the way we find that place is continuing the journey toward God. The last thing we ought to be doing is settling for any place along the way. And so we're called not to settle for a place or a circumstance or a certain point in time. We're called to follow with Jesus, to keep taking the next step home, to move towards God knowing we find God on the road and we bring blessing along the road. And this image that we're given at the end of, of all time in Revelation, where we're told what the end is going to look like, what this kingdom of God that as it spreads out across the world, bringing the good news across the world to all people, the promise isn't to go back to Babel, where we'll be one people that all speak the same language, all think the same thing, all do the same thing. But instead we will see the fruit of the plan, of the good redemption plan that God had from the beginning. Revelation 7, 9 says, After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every tribe, nation, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. We, and we're told in Revelation uh, 21 that all the good, beautiful things of the kingdom, all the glory of the kingdom of the world will be brought in to the kingdom of God. 
that we see that God never intended to punish us by giving us different languages and different cultures, but to point us to him, to be part of the redemption plan. And all of that will be brought into the kingdom as we are pilgrims and we travel with him wherever we find ourselves. And so what does that look like for us right now? You know, what does it look like for us to keep moving? It doesn't necessarily mean go quit your job, move to a different place, uproot all your circumstances, but it also means don't get stuck. Don't settle into one picture of your life, into one picture of what faith looks like. And Jesus, he gave us the instructions of what it looks like to be a pilgrim and not a nomad. He says this in Matthew 28, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And so Jesus, he tells us you don't need to settle out of fear because I am with you always. There's no place you can go that he's not with you. There's no circumstance you can, you can be in that he's not with you. There's nothing that he can ask you to do that he's not going to go there and alongside you. And so we don't have to refuse and we don't have to resist. We can say yes. We can keep stepping towards God when he asks us to do hard and challenging things. Why? Because we don't have to be afraid. Because we're never alone. And he says, you don't have to make a name for yourself. You don't have to worry about your own significance. Why? Because all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to him. And so it is his name where we find our significance. It is in the work that he has done and partnering with him and making him known. And so we don't have to worry about whether our lives are significant or not. Our lives are significant if they're part of what Jesus has called them to be, if they're part of the kingdom of God, if they're moving that forward. And then we never have to settle for less because he tells us, make disciples. Go and teach them everything that I have taught you. And we've talked a lot about that here at The Well, that that word disciple means to be a learner, not an expert. It, it means learner. And so Jesus is saying, go and be a learner and make other learners. So don't settle for less than that. Always, every situation that God puts us in, every, every challenge, every new thing that comes our way, we ask, God, how can I look more like you? How can I be more like Jesus? And how can I help others know Jesus more? That is the call of our lives. We're called to settle for nothing less. And we hear this word, go, go and do that. And we often think, just go somewhere and find some place. But actually, that word is, as you are going. As you are going about your life, as you are going about your career, as you are going about your family, as you are going about your friendships, as you are going about being a church community, as you go, make disciples. As you go, I am always with you. As you go, don't worry because I have all the authority. Don't worry. And when we see that that's the call, not to get stuck out of fear or pride or control, but to keep taking each step with God, knowing there's always more to this life. We surrender our towers, we let go of our blueprints, and we start building the kingdom of God instead of a, kingdom, instead of a tower of insecurity. That's what we're called to do, to partner with God, walking towards our home, which is always found in Him. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for these first 11 chapters of Genesis. Thank you for the context that they provide, the setup to understand our need for a rescue, understand our need for redemption. And God, for those of us who maybe have feel like we have settled, feel like we have gotten stuck in life, we've settled out of fear, we've settled for less, we've settled into pride, that we're so busy trying to give ourselves a sense of security or significance or control that we've lost sight of you. Would you help us, God, to keep moving, to keep stepping, to journey with you, to see ourselves as pilgrims and not as nomads, and to know that as we walk with you, we build the kingdom with you, and we take one step closer to the home that we know that we are purposely journeying towards. God, let us be that individually. Let us be that as a community, to never settle for less, but to always be journeying with you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.